Bangladesh, once known as Greater Bengal. Long before 1947, the territory of Bengal was vast. The advancement of civilization in Bengal dates back four millennia. During the Imperial Age, Bengal is estimated to have had the largest economy of the world. They were controlling a quarter of the world's wealth. Bengal was shaken by the arrival of the mentally and physically strong warriors. That was the end of Bengal's classical era. Where the message of Islam began the journey of Bhakti Arkilji in Bengal. A good part of the population welcomed the broad-minded religion. The great religious scholar Hazrat Shah Jalal had begun propagating Islam in the region, albeit moderately. Islam brought with it the end of centuries of conflict between the ancient religions. A secular Bengal began to develop peacefully. The sultans came one after another. Policies introduced by earlier sultans were perpetuated by the sultans who came later. 200 years passed this way. Scholars of other religions were allowed to speak out in the court of Barbak Sultan Shah. The learned were given honor and patronage. With the death of the Sultan came the advent of a modern but cunning people. The intention of Portuguese East India Company in Bengal was to do business and spread their religion, Christianity. Theirs was a frightening trade, that of enslaving men and women living in coastal areas and riversides and then selling the slaves. With their intelligence and bullishness, the Portuguese soon made friends with the lords of the land and they did business in Bengal for 150 years. The oppression by the Portuguese and their collaborators gradually enraged the common people. Unhappy with the situation, Qasim Khan destroyed the biggest base of the Portuguese East India Company, which was in Hooghly. The Portuguese were driven out of Bengal, but they still had the maps of Bengal's marketplaces, city ports and trade centers. One by one, the selfish Europeans built their bases along Bengal. But the only ones to survive until the end were the British East India Company. Besides business, the East India Company had some far-reaching goals. Willing to help them achieve their unsavory goals was Mir Jafar Ali Khan, a close relative and the commander-in-chief of Bengal's independent Nawab, Siraj Dola. Taking a bribe of 40 million pounds, Mir Jafar Ali Khan provoked a war between the Nawab and the East India Company. Nawab Siraj Dola lost the war. In 1765, the Mughal Emperor Ali Gohar allowed the British to collect taxes from Bengal. They grabbed the chance to rule Bengal instead. 
to increase the export of cloth made in British mills, the East India Company terrorised the Bengali textile weavers. They even cut off the thumbs that wove the wonder cloth muslin. They illegally stocked up wheat, rice and grains in their warehouses in order to provoke a shortage in the market. To meet the wheat demands of the whole of India, a third of Bengal's population was pushed toward certain death. An artificial famine had been introduced. The lease price of farmland was raised tenfold. Landlords were in trouble. In their fight for survival, hungry peasants began to sell their wives and daughters. In every corner of Bengal, the people were desperate to fight back. In the 18th century, even monks were fighting the British. The struggle was intensified by Devi Jodhurani and Bhobani Patok. A ferocious attack by Fokir Mojnu Shah left the British frustrated and their hold over North Bengal crumbled. The consequence was widespread unrest. In August of 1782, Chakma revolutionary leader Ramu Khan overthrew a British garrison. Mohsenuddin Ahmed Dudunya had European indigo factories burnt to ashes. At the same time, the simple peasants also united in revolt and took up their bows and arrows to wage a bloody war against the British lords. In 1831, the British blew up the bamboo fort of Titumir at Narikilbaria. The rebel leader was killed. But the East India Company soon had a greater rebel to fear. The first supreme leader of the Republic of India, Mastodar Shurjo Shen, had driven out the British and the Chittagong region remained independent for three days. Inspired by the armed revolution of Mastodar Shurjo Shen, Shobhash Chandra Bosch made a master plan to attack the British across the whole of India. But the plan did not see the light of success. For a thousand years, the soil of Bengal had been plundered by Afghans, Mughals, the Portuguese and the English, all in the name of religion, trade and culture. These simple, peace-loving people took beatings over and over again, protesting on numerous occasions only to remain in the grip of subservience. Why? Because the support of the masses was missing. In 1947, the British divided the land based on religion and gave birth to a country of two incompatible nations. The selfish needs of others led to the fragmentation of the pristine land of Bengal. But the heritage of Bengal was to remain as alive as ever. The guardians of Bengal were preparing to strike back. The greatest leader had just emerged to dry the spilled blood and release the muffled cry of the long-suppressed Bengalis. Sangram, Sadi Jatar Sangram!